Let's pray for the choir member who are going to minister, all ministers that are going to serve the Lord, the usher, the security, everybody, go we are not there with the Holy Ghost and power. They work under the power of the Holy Ghost. There will be testimony every night, testimony galore, testimony of great, great wonders of God every night. It is possible with God. God has done it in the time past. He did it in the previous GCK crusade. We we'll do it here in Ocean State of Shubo. Pray and God will do it. We shall experience the great power of God here in Oshobo. Pray and talk to the Lord in prayer. Our God is able, our God is well able. In Jesus' name we pray. And tonight also, let's pray that heaven we open and declare his word unto every one of us, the servant and the saints of God, that tonight heaven will open and the blessing of God will come out upon our upon, upon life in Jesus' name. I want us to pray. We will not just come as usual, we will not attend the as usual, but today we have something to your life and to my life as well. Something real, something wonderful, something tangible that people can know that today we attended the Bible study for a reason, for a purpose. The man of God, as he prepares, God will prepare him especially for tonight's Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for the great miracle crusade. Thank you for the GCK. Thank you for the arrowhead of the program, our Father and the Lord. Anointing especially in Jesus' name. As minister, Lord, I pray that we bring about joy, blessings, salvation, healing, deliverances to people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. I thank the Lord for you that you are coming, but you need to tell other people the study of the Bible is the backbone of the believer. And even it helps the sinners to discover the way, the way to life eternal. Do everything you can do to influence all members of the church and then now outsiders so that we will be at the Bible study together to learn at the same table of the Lord. Will you do it? God help you. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We're asking, Lord, that your spirit will take your word and give us understanding, revelation, as well as the strength and the grace to be obedient to your word as a teachers in Jesus' name. Speak to your people here and all over the world, everywhere we're connected, and let your word bring illumination to every heart. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Galatians chapter 5. And today we're studying from verse 1 all through to verse 6. Galatians 5 verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In verse 3, it tells us, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you, are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. In verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And I in verse 6, For in Jesus Christ, 
neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith that walketh by love. As we look at those verses, we're examining our glorious liberty and freedom in Christ. Before we came to Christ, we were in bondage, bound by all the things that came into our lives and that were expressed in our lives. But now, after coming to Christ, every yoke broken, all the bondages taken away, it brings us to a glorious liberty and freedom by a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And as we look at these verses, we're going to think of three points. Number one, freedom from the yoke of bondage through Christ. Number two, falling under the yoke and bondage of circumcision. Number three, faith which walketh by love in the new creature. Look at number one. Number one, freedom from the yoke of bondage through Christ. Again, in verse one of Galatians chapter five, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, liberty and freedom, liberation and freedom. As we come to Christ, it is not just a nominal relationship. It's an actual, a definite relationship. It touches our hearts. It forgives our sins. It sets us free from the sins of the past. And it releases us into new life in Christ. And Paul, the apostle said, Galatians, you have met the Lord, the crucified one. You have met the Lord, the Savior. And he has saved you and set you free. And because he has set you free, remain solidly in that freedom that grace has brought into your life. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again. There's a possibility after the freedom, after the liberation, after the conversion, after the salvation, there's a possibility of going back to the yoke of bondage and being entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Look at three things here. Number one, total liberation from the bondage of sin. Number two, true liberty through believing in the Savior. And number three, transformed living of true believers as saints. Let's look at number one. Number one is total liberation from the bondage of sin. When Christ takes up a life and sets that life free, it is not partial freedom. It is not partial salvation. It is not partial liberation. It is total. It is complete. And the Lord forgives every sin that had been committed and sets the man and sets the woman and sets that combat free from all the sins of the past. In John chapter 8 verse 30. And it says, as he speak these words, many believed on him. In verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, the word of revelation, the word of righteousness, the word of repentance you just heard, and you just discovered, and you have believed, and now your sins are remitted, your lives are changed and transformed, and there's redemption. You must continue. Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And then he says in verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, the truth that saves, the truth that sustains, and the truth that sanctifies, and the truth that makes us stand firmly in the liberty that he has called us into. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
Look at verse 36. In verse 36, it says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 18. It says, I'm being then made free from sin. That's the freedom. That's the liberty. When we say we have liberty, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made you free, it's not talking about freedom to sin, freedom to live a loose life, and freedom to go back into the old pit from where we were dug. It is freedom to live in righteousness, being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, But now be made free from sin. Look at Paul the Apostle repeating what he had said because of the importance and because of the misunderstanding that some people may have that, you know, we are free and yet we are free. That means that now I'm saved, I'm born again. I'm free to do anything I want. I'm free to say anything I want. I'm free to double into whatever I want to double into. It says, no, the freedom is talking about is that it's set us free from the bondage of sin. It set us free from the character and the habit of sinfulness. And now it sets us free free to live aright and free to live in righteousness but now be made free from sin you became the servants to god free from sin free from satan and free from every yoke and free from every bondage and ye have your fruit unto holiness at the end everlasting life in romans chapter 8 reading from verse 1 in romans chapter 8 verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ they are in christ and what's the mark what's the evidence that we're now in christ who walk not after the flesh or the works of the flesh they're cancelled they are paralyzed and they do not have authority or power or hold upon the believer anymore and because of that freedom in Christ it says we walk not after the flesh but after the spirit look at verse 2 it says for the law of the spirit of life in Christ in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Let's come to number two here. Point number two is the true liberty through believing in the Savior. True liberty, it calls us to liberty and there is true liberty. There is false idea about liberty. I'm born again, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I have liberty now to do anything I want to do. That's a false notion, a false idea, a false understanding of liberty in Christ. The true liberty in Christ, we're told. Look at uh, Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 18. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. Look at this. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. To set at liberty them that are bruised. It's like an animal has been tied down and could not move away from where it was. But now you come to lose the strings and the cord and the chain. And now the animal is free to do what the creator had ordained that that animal will do. Now we're liberated. And true liberty means God created us. He created us to express and to exhibit 
the image of Christ, conformity to Christ, and the life of Christ. But because we are depraved, defiled, and detained in sin, we could not, we could not express the nature of God or the Christ-like nature that we ought to exhibit or we need to express. And now he comes and he sets us free. And so all those things of the past that we were bound with, we're now free from them and we are now able to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. The unclean spirits that bound them in unclean lifestyle, unclean habit, unclean disposition, those unclean spirits are cast out and they become free. And so they will not continue in what they used to do. Romans chapter 8 verse 21. In Romans chapter 8 verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Delivered from the bondage of corruption. In our offices, there are those who are corrupt. And when you are saved, you are delivered from that bondage of corruption. And in the community, there are those who live corrupted life, corrupting lives. And they influence other people to go to the same corruption. But now you are born again and you are free from that bondage of corruption. Between men and women, between boys and girls. Else, there are uh, exhibitions and the, and the expression of corruption, corrupt lifestyle, corrupt language, corrupt behavior, corrupt interaction, but now you are saved. If you are a child, you are saved. You have liberty now from that corruption in the community. If you are youth and you are saved, you have liberty now from the corruption that pollutes and destroys the lives of young people. If you an adult, if you're an office worker, if you're selling in the market, the things that the market people do that make them corrupt, now you are born again and there's a change of life and you are delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Glorious liberty. You are now a child of God and you are not ashamed of that. You are different from the people of the world because the grace of God has come into your life and the strength and the boldness to live a life that is distinct, a life that is totally different from your community. The Lord has given to you because you are delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In verse 29, it says, For whom he did for no, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the liberty. Christ lived a life free from Satan. And so now he wants us to be conformed to that same image free from Satan. He lived a life free from sin, every form of sin. And he wants you now that you have had this uh, transformation and conversion through him. He wants you to also have that same life of Christ, freedom from sin. Uh, he was uh, free from the activities and the superstition of society. That's Christ. He lived the life that everybody knew that this is the Son of God. He wants us to have conformity to that same image of Christ, conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, liberation, liberty, freedom 
freedom from the fear of man that brings a snare freedom from the pressure of society that you know pushes people do it do it do it uh, freedom from the idiosyncrasies and all the ideologies of sinners that want to take over your life and live your life for you and run your life for you they want to influence you in the worldly way to do what they do to say what they say to act the way they act to sin the way they are sinning but now there is liberty there is liberation and there is uh, freedom because where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty look at verse 18 uh, and see the result of that liberation the result of that liberty but we all with open face beholding uh, as in a glass the glory of the lord are changed into the same image the character of Christ, the model of Christ, the pattern of Christ as we look at Christ as Savior, as Sanctifier, the one who has set us free, free from outward sins and free from the root of sin. He sets us free and we now look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are changed were transformed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord galatians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 13 in verse 13 for brethren ye have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh don't misunderstand that liberty don't misinterpret the liberty. Use not the liberty for the occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. I pray that this real scriptural understanding of liberty and freedom and liberation will show forth in every life in Jesus name look at number three number three here transformed living transformed lifestyle of true believers as saints Romans chapter 12 reading from verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice now you are set free by the mercy of god now you are converted by the mercy of god you are transformed by the mercy of god what do you do do you say okay i'm at liberty now i can use my body the way i want i can use my whatever the way i want it's mine he says no that now you present your bodies every part of your body your hands what they touch your eyes what they see your ears what they hear your feet where they walk to your mind how you think it's not you know you're not committing your mind to anger animosity hatred anymore you present every part of yourself your body is a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service in verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed we're set at liberty to demonstrate to live a transformed life it changed life it says transformed by the renewing of your mind that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 if any man be in christ how do we know it's not by the talk of mouth it's not by loud, loud testimony. Testimonies that are not corroborated 
by the lifestyle no it is the newness of character the newness of conduct and the newness of behavior that shows that that man truly that woman truly is in christ therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things have passed away not they are passing away i'm not you know a finished product yet i know there's still a lot of sins uh -uh. it's not that they're passing away little by little i was smoking before if you knew when i was smoking heavily i could smoke a two packets of cigarettes a day but now just have a packet doesn't work that way if any man be in christ is a new creature old things are passed away if you knew what i was before i used to you know even though he was married he used to have you know five women ten women but now it's limited them to just a few he says i am a new creature in the making not at all if any man be in christ is a new creature Old things have passed away. Old character passed away. And old uh, kind of behavior, everything is passed away. And the old anger, and the old fighting, and the old hypocrisies have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Amen. In your life, all things have become new in the public and in the private because you are born again and because you are set at liberty by the lord whether you're in the private and nobody will ever know what you are doing all the same your nature has been changed your inner man has been changed and your strength within you are a man of conviction whether people are there or not you're a new creature you're a woman of conviction whether people will know it or not you're a new creature and all things are passed away and behold all things have become new colossians chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 10 it says and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him you put on christ jesus that's the liberty that the freedom he wants us to stand in that and never allow anything to take that life of christ away from you that you put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him look at verse 15 there in verse 15 it says and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which ye also are called in one body and be ye thankful look at verse 17 in verse 17 it says and whatsoever ye do in word or deed whatsoever in the office whatsoever in the home whatsoever when you feel hungry whatsoever because there are some people when they feel hungry it's like salvation is pushed aside and now the hunger will express anger any time and every time anywhere and everywhere when you are driving on the road and you know the law enforcing uh, agents uh, they, you know they confront you where is this where is this if you don't have have the right document you're not going to bribe because you are a christian and you are set free from all that uh, bribing and you know doing this and that whatsoever you do on the road whatsoever you do at home whatsoever you do in the office whatsoever you do well, the opposite sex you're a man with woman you're a woman with men whatsoever you do in word or deed anytime anywhere everywhere do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him amen, amen. point number two point number two we're looking at falling under the yoke of bondage the bondage of circumcision it says in um, galatians chapter 5 uh, reading from verse 2 behold i paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised christ 
shall profit you nothing. These were gentle believers. They had not been circumcised before because they, were, they didn't know Moses. They were not following the, the law of Moses. But now Christ came to them as Savior, as Redeemer. And Paul the Apostle presented Christ the Savior unto them. And they were saved, born again. They knew the Lord and they knew that salvation depended only on their faith in Christ. They had repented from all their gentle lifestyle that they were living before. Now they were born again and then some people were coming to them and telling them, if you are not circumcised, your salvation is not complete. You must add the law of Moses to your faith in Christ. And they were being confused, and some of them as adults, some of them as Gentiles, some of them as heathens that didn't know about circumcision before. They were now going into circumcision because of the confusion of the Judaizers. That's why he now said, Behold, I Paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That circumcision that you are not depending on will cancel the effect of Christ's work of grace in your life. And the same thing today, after you have believed in Christ, if you go back to the superstition of the denominations that believe in some superstition and they say, yes, you are born again, but you must add this idea, this opinion, this circumcision, this religious sacrifice. If you do that, Christ shall profit you nothing. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Then in verse 4, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Acts chapter 15, reading from verse 1. And certain men which came from Judea taught the brethren. These were brethren. And they said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. They were already brethren, they were born again, they were children of God, they had the assurance within them, Christ saved me from sin. And the Spirit of God bore witness in their heart, they were children of God. And then some people came to introduce another doctrine, to introduce circumcision, and to introduce the rights and the rules coming from the old covenant. That's the confusion. That's why Paul the Apostle was telling them, if you go into that and you are not circumcised and you add all those beads and pieces of the old covenant into the new covenant, you will not remain saved. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? The circumcision they were bringing was to be a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Falling under the yoke of and bondage of circumcision. Three things. Number one, the falling. Those who are falling from grace through heathen's circumcision. Number two, the falsehood of glory in historic circumcision. That is, there were people that were glory in that old, ancient, historic circumcision. And that is false. The falsehood of glory in historic circumcision. Number three is the foundation for godliness in heart circumcision. Number one, the falling. Those who are falling from grace through 
the hidden circumcision. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 4. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Those who go to other things apart from faith in Christ, Christ only, Christ the Savior, Christ the Sanctifier, Christ the Supplier of all our needs, those who abandon Christ and they go into uh, ceremonies and rites and denominational tradition, they are falling from grace. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 6 it says i marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of christ unto another gospel when you arch to the word of god that's another gospel when you subtract from the word of god that's another gospel when you make allowance for your deficiency you change the doctrine of the bible and change the word of god to accommodate your weakness your sinfulness your backsliding behavior when you change the word of god so that you can excuse your behavior that is not right that's another gospel already it says i marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you into the gospel of christ unto another gospel in verse 7 it says which is not another but there be some that trouble you there be some that knock at your door and they want to present false doctrine to you there are some that come from the angle of prophecy and then they prophesy 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 no salvation in the prophecy and there's no righteousness in the prophecy there's no holiness in the prophecy and there is no obedience to the law to the word of god in the prophecy 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 and they want to rule your life and ruin your life by their prophecy it says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Then in verse 8, it says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which were preached unto you, let him be a curse. The Lord wants us to stay with the foundation of the gospel and with the reality of the gospel. He doesn't want us adding something, subtracting something, bringing the rules and regulations of tradition and adding them to the word of God. He wants us to keep the gospel pure purified as it has been given unto us. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be a cause. Let's look at number two. Number two, the falsehood of glory in historic circumcision in galatians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 12 galatians 6 reading from verse 12 as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. That is, they want to make a fair show. They want to prove to the Jewish people that yes, we believe in Christ, but we are still of the Jewish religion, the glory in historic circumcision. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, for neither they themselves so are circumcised, keep the law. But the desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. That they may glory. They don't want a change of character. They don't want to have a glorious experience of sanctification and inner holiness and purity. 
All they want is to have the glory that they're in control of your life. They're in control of introducing circumcision to you, introducing superstition to you, introducing tradition to you, and you accept that. They want to be able to count, I influence such and such, so and so. He was standing on salvation before, before I met her. He was standing on living a new life before, before I met her. My interaction with her now, my interaction with him now has turned him and changed him. He looks up to me now. Now, whatever I say, that is what he does. That's what she does. They want to glory in your backsliding. They want to glory in your circumcision. They want to glory in influencing you that you are looking away from Christ and looking unto them that they may glory in your flesh. We're looking at Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. And restest in the law and make it thy boast of God. Verse 18 and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Verse 19 and it says, And thou art confident that thou art thyself a guide of the blind and a light of them which are in darkness verse 20 says an instructor of the foolish a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law verse 21 thou therefore that teachest another teachest not thou thyself Thou that teachest another, the basic truth had been given to the people they were trying to talk to, that Christ is the Savior, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then they creep in, they sneak in, and they're going to confuse the people and turn away their eyes from Christ the Savior. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest not thou thyself, thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? You preach that others should not steal, but you don't have the grace of God in your own life. That you will not steal, steal anything like stealing, um, you know, uh, whatever it is from your office. You're using there, you're supposed to use it there, and then you have to take it home. And you, a lot of things in your house like that, you have taken from your office, from your place of work. Now that teaches others, I'm a house fellowship leader, I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, and you're preaching. Now that teaches others. Don't you teach yourself that the preachers that a man should not steal, does thou steal? Verse 22. In verse 22, thou that says a man should not commit adultery. Does thou commit adultery? Maybe you even discipline other people. What has he done? He has committed adultery, not in our church. In our church here, we believe in holiness, we believe in purity. It's not just the talk of the mouth. You discipline others. I about you yourself. Do you commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Verse 23. In verse 23, thou that makest boast of the law. Through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. Verse 24, it tells us, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. 25, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. Circumcision profiteth if you keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made on circumcision. In verse 26, therefore, thou circumcised, if he keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his circumcision be counted for circumcision. Verse 27, and shall not 
uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Now verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but God. Those who are looking for the praise of men, anything they do, if uh, men are not there to see, they won't do right. But if people are there, then they do right. That's just external. They're doing it for show. They're doing it for exhibition. But the person who is circumcised in the heart, who is sanctified in the heart, that whether people will know of their good works or they will not know of their good works, with all transparency and sincerity, they do what is right because the only praise and the only glory they are looking for is the praise from God. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the foundation for godliness in heart circumcision. Heart circumcision. Actually, as Abraham was given the circumcision in the flesh, the Jewish people, they centered on that and they gloried in that. But you understand? They were circumcised on the eighth day. And so on the eighth day, that circumcision was not in their hand. It was not their decision. It was not their obedience. It was the obedience of their parents. So they had nothing to glory of that somebody is circumcised at the age of eight. Each day, is, there's no repentance required for that. There's no consecration required for that. And there is no commitment required in that. It's the praying decision. They're circumcised. No glory in that. It's the heart circumcision. Now, you're grown up. And you see that some character, some behavior demonstrates uh, depravity and demonstrates defilement. And then you go to God and says, my son, give me thine heart. This is your personal decision now. And then you go to God and you give your heart unto the Lord. And let your eyes observe my ways. And then you say, from your own heart, I am going to turn to the Lord. I am going to live for the Lord. And then he calls and says, I want to circumcise your heart. And you go to God. God with deliberate intention and with consecration and with conviction that you want your heart circumcised. That's the one that has the praise of God. The other circumcision of the flesh that your parents did when you were young and didn't know anything at all, that one has no glory. It is the heart circumcision. And that is what the Heavenly Father had promised. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. This will not be done by a sojourner. This will not be done by a father. This will not be done by a mother. It is God himself that will do this. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. And when it is done, you will love the Lord thy God. God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Let's come back to Romans chapter 2 and read from verse 29. In verse 29 it says, For he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, 
but of God. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 11. There's the circumcision that matters in the sight of God, in whom, that's in Christ, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, without human hands. This is by the oppression of grace, the oppression of God himself. Circumcision with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins, the root of sin, the nature of sin. That's the real circumcision that matters in the sight of the Lord putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision of Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 6. But now, I see Christ obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises look at verse 8 in verse 8 for finding fault of them it says behold the days come says the lord when i will make a new covenant for the house of israel and for the house of Judah. What was the result of that new covenant? Verse 10. In verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, says the Lord, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. That's the heart circumcision. And when you think about yourself, you have the word of God reaching on a table of your heart. What God delights in, what God desires, what God has commanded, that inward nature of holiness, that inward nature of righteousness that you carry with you all the days of your life, anywhere you go, that inward conviction of heart that you carry with you and you are sensitive of that every time, everywhere, whatever you're doing. It says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. I pray it will be done in every heart and every life in Jesus name. Look at point number three now. Point number three is the faith that walketh by love in the new creature. In Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The hope that the righteous people have, those who are righteous from the inside, from their heart. The hope we have, we wait for that by faith. In verse 6, in verse 6, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith that walketh by love. The faith that walketh by love. Three things we're looking at. Number one is the hope. The hope of the righteous by faith in the Lord. Number two, the heart of the righteous in faithfulness to his lordship. Number three, the honesty of the righteous by the fruit of love. Look at number one. Number one, the hope of the righteous by faith in the Lord. It tells us in that Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, for we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The hope of the righteous by faith in the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1, therefore, being justified Fight by faith, forgiven by faith, set free by faith, 
acquitted that God does not reckon the sins of the past to our account anymore. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. He gives us a lively hope now. We're saved. We're forgiven. There's no condemnation, no judgment anymore. And because of that, we have a living hope, a lively hope in the Lord. And we live by hope. We know that when he comes, he'll take us away to be with him. The hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. In verse 3, it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, in persecution also, knowing that tribulation, persecution, trial, worketh patience, perseverance. And then in verse 4, and patience and perseverance, worketh experience, and experience worketh hope. Then in verse 5, it says, and hope maketh not ashamed the hope we have in the Lord because of what he has done for us is purchased a place in heaven for us and he has purchased us to feed the place is going to make for us because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us first peter chapter one reading from verse three the hope of the righteous by faith in the lord first peter chapter one verse three blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, born again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Then he says in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. That, that hope, and that inheritance is reserved in heaven, in heaven for every genuine, born again, new creature, new believer, that that hope is in heaven. And it's when we get there, if anyone faints by the way, if anyone gives up in the middle of the way, that inheritance, you will not get it because it is reserved for you in heaven heaven look at verse 5 in verse 5 who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time first john chapter 3 read him from verse 1 in first john chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. By repentance and faith in Christ, now are we the sons of God. By coming out from among them and being separate from the world, now are we the sons of God by holding on steadfastly, tenaciously, unwaveringly unto the faith that we had originally. And we will not look back and will not change our conviction in the Lord. Now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself 
even as he is pure. If somebody says, I have hope, I get to heaven, I have mansions there, I have inheritance in heaven, but it's not pure, it's not holy, it's not righteous, he has, you know, evil thoughts, he has evil character, he has secret covered up sin, and yet he says, I believe, I hope, I'm going to get to heaven. That's not a lively hope, that's a rotten hope. That hope is not going to be fulfilled. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I pray that the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb will avail for everyone in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two here is the heart of the righteous in faithfulness to his Lord. Righteousness from the heart. That shows that we're real believers. We're born again. We're transformed. We're made in our heart conformed unto the Lord. And it is the heart that matters. If the heart is not right, all the good works externally, outwardly, they're nothing in the sight of the Lord. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. The heart of the righteous in faithfulness to his lordship. Luke chapter 16 verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. There are people that say this is a little thing. They can be unfaithful there. He that is unfaithful, unjust in the least, is unjust, unfaithful in much. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. If you do anything and your heart is not always there, sincerity is not there, honesty is not there, and uh, real commitment is not there, the way you do anything is the way you do everything else. That's why from the words of Jesus, he that is faithful in that which is least, is faithful also in much. First Timothy chapter 3, we're reading from verse 11. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, but sober, faithful in all things. Not only for the wives of the deacons, everyone a believer, even so must the believers be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things not just the believers alone the ministers the preachers the pastors that they don't live superficial lives hollow lives frivolous life careless lives even so must the ministers be grave not slanderous sober faithful in all things, all things at home to your spouse, all things in the community, in your duty that you are serving the community, all things that you are faithful to yourself, that you are not doing things that your conscience is disagreeing with you, saying, okay, go your own way, but me, your conscience, I'm not with you. We must be faithful in all things. It tells us in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine but to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Hebrews chapter 3, 
We're reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, that's the kind of brethren we ought to be, not unrighteous brethren, sinful brethren, hypocritical brethren, unbelieving brethren, sinful brethren. No, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus then in verse 2 it says who was faithful to him that appointed him that's Christ he was faithful to God to the father who appointed him who sent him and everything the father has taught me that I do everywhere the father sent him there he went and the method and the manner that the father expects what he appointed for him to do he did everything according to that manner according to that mode according to that model he was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house look at verse 5 in verse 5 and Moses this verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast. Whose house we are, if we hold fast. A new friend that we just met will not divert you from what you have been holding fast to. If heaven is your goal, a new place of work you just got to will not diminish, will not dilute your conviction if you are aiming to get to heaven. A new relationship you have just formed uh, will not dim your eyesight, will not dim your conviction or slow you down if we hold fast. A new opportunity you have uh, will not intoxicate you if you are going to get to heaven. Whatever the condition, whatever new relationship, and whatever new opportunities or privilege you have, but Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end look at number three here is the honesty of the righteous by the fruit of love in Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 for in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith that walketh by love. Now, somebody cannot say, I have faith, I have faith. We say, stop talking, let's see the evidence. Let that faith work. Let it work a new life, a transformed life a heavenly life, a holy life, a righteous life. It is the demonstration of what the faith does that makes us to know that faith is present there. Circumcision availeth nothing. Uncircumcision availeth nothing. The circumcision of the Jews availed nothing. The uncircumcision of the Gentiles availed nothing. But faith, whether you're Jew or Gentile, the faith that walketh by love. First Peter chapter 1 verse 8. Whom have ye not seen ye love? In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Verse 22. In verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls, sanctified your souls, purged your souls, cleansed your souls, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You're purified, it will lead to obedience to the truth. You're purged, 
it will lead to obedience to the truth. You are cleansed, it will lead to obedience to the truth. You have an experience with Christ in God. That experience, we cannot tell, we cannot see. It is inside you there. It is your obedience we can see. It is the obedience that will show the evidence you have, the grace of God within, seeing He has purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unpretending love, unfeigned love, unhypocritical love, a sincere love, a transparent love, a purifying love of the brethren. See that she love one another with a pure heart fervently. In Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 8, Romans chapter 13, we're reading from verse 8, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. It's not talking about lust. I love, I love, I love. It's not talking about lust, evil. It's not talking about what uh, the people call erotic love. A kind of love that is fleshly, the fleshly contact is what brings them uh, the joy and satisfaction. It's talking about the pure love of God, the love that makes us to live the way a child of God ought to live, transparent, pure, holy, righteous, that doesn't have any suggestion of evil. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the Lord. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you love your neighbor, you'll not commit adultery with his wife or with her husband. If you love your neighbor, you'll not murder, you'll not kill, you'll not slander, you'll not uh, kill or um, destroy his prospects in life. If you love, you will not steal. If you love, you'll not bear false witness against anybody and bring him into unnecessary trouble. If you love, you will not covet what belongs to another person and wanting him to lose that thing so you can have uh, any other commandment of the Lord is based on this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it tells us, love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. We're looking at First John chapter 5, reading from verse 2. First John chapter 5, verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 3 there, in verse 3 it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They are not irksome. They are not giving us any discomfort. We love God. We love his word. We love God and we love his commandments. We love God and love everything that he loves. And when the love of God is there, you are born again and the love of God is settled in your heart. You are sanctified and made holy and the love of God is deepened in your heart. You love God. You love the word of God. You love the work of God. You love everything and you 
love him sincerely you love him honestly you love him from the depth of your heart you love him in the open you love him in the private you love him when people are there when people are not there you love him with all your heart and it's a joy for you to be obedient to the Lord because the love of God is established in your heart I pray that this love will be established in the heart of everyone in Jesus name in your heart I said in your heart a saving love a sanctifying love a purifying love a fervent love a love that will not be deemed a love that will not be cancelled or put to shame or, or taken away by all the conditions of life in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and take everything we have learned today to the Lord in prayer this is the time to show that we accept the word we receive the word I want the word to do a transforming work of grace in our lives open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer have you been set free by the Lord liberty liberation freedom free from sin free from the old habits have you come into the Lord today examine your life are you still in bondage to any bad habit are you still in bondage to any sinful character are you still in bondage to something you know, that you have had before even before you became a believer check up and say Lord this must go it calls us to total liberation total complete an area of your life that needs the transforming power of the Lord are you under any yoke bondage you want to do right you cannot that's bondage you want to live righteous you cannot that's bondage in the office they sway you that you cannot take a stand and be immovable and you're saying i know i shouldn't do this i know i shouldn't do that but here is my challenge take that challenge to the lord tonight and let there be total liberation if it's the fear of man that is hindering you from living the life that you ought to live take that to the lord tonight and say lord break this yoke of the fear of man away from my life if it's self-love you love yourself so much that you indulge yourself and that indulges does not make you to live a life liberated from the sinful nature tell the lord this self-love self-pity petting myself all this must go pray this is your chance for the lord to work in your life true liberty as you believe in the savior you believe he can do all things let him do it you believe he can cleanse you wash you purge you purify you until there is no stain of the Adamic nature again, what can he not do? Tell him. His blood washes whiter than snow.
a transformed lifestyle that you all know all those dirty things of the world will not have any place in your heart, in your life anymore. Whatever tradition, whatever superstition, whatever ideology, whatever philosophy you are trying to add to the gospel, that makes Christ unprofitable for you, that makes you fall from the grace of God. Identify those ideas, that falsehood, that opinion, identify them. Get rid of them. Christ and Christ alone without the circumcision of the Jews Christ, Christ alone without the opinions and the ideologies of man Christ, Christ alone the only savior there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus the sacrifice, the substitution, the salvation we have from Christ. Believe in the blood is shed for you. It cleanses, it purifies, it sanctifies. And when Christ sanctifies, he does it thoroughly. When Christ transforms, he does it thoroughly. You will know. And the Spirit of God will bear witness with your heart. I am sanctified I am purified I am made holy he does it being made free from sin you became the servants of God and now you live your life unto righteousness and holiness The righteous has hope. The religious who is not born again has no hope. What's your hope? If you don't believe in Christ, what's your hope? If you are not a new creature in Christ, what's your hope? If all you depend on is circumcision, church membership, what's your hope? If all you have is external righteousness. What's your hope? If your heart is not right with God, the hope of the righteous is based on the experience of salvation, of sanctification that we have in Christ. It's available for everyone. Call and the Lord will answer heart circumcision the Lord has called us to salvation we have responded he calls us to sanctification the cleansing of the heart the taking away of the stony heart 
and granting us graciously, mercifully, the heart of flesh. Heart circumcision. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, your children, the heart of your seed, your converts, or sanctify, circumcise the heart of every member in Christ to love the Lord our God without reservation, love Him without a rival, that nothing of the world rivals the love you have for God. You love Him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Heart circumcision that takes all those things hidden in the heart that does not have you to reflect, help you to reflect the image of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the nature of Christ. Gives us honesty. And we love honestly. We don't love only with the sound of the voice. We love heartily from the heart, honestly, sincerely, nothing hidden, no playing or pranks. No pretense. We love God, we love his word, and nothing will make us think of parting with the word of the God we love. We love believers as Christ has loved us. And we love our neighbors like ourselves. Our faith walketh by love. No pretense, no hypocrisy, no make believe. We love him because he first loved us. And his love flows to everyone around us. And everybody will see we have been with the Lord. He has pardoned our sins. He has purified our spirit. He has empowered us graciously to go and live the way he demands in his word. And with all sincerity, honesty, we go out to live for Christ who gave his life for us.